get into the question of Scorpion Sense is a real, a real interesting read and full of many surprises. You have an excellent account of Cuba under my piece in the lead up of the Castro regime. Another detail that surprised me was how the CIA undermined Aristotle and Nassus. Uh, you write in your book, Nixon was too, Nixon too was getting a taste of Cobra action with President Eisenhower and executives of the Seven Sisters, the seven largest oil companies in America, grew concerned in 1954 that Greek shipping magnate Arafel and Nassus was on the verge of gaining a monopoly on oil shipments in Saudi Arabia. Nixon led a CIA organized initiative to Balkan. The agency contracted with a former FBI agent turned public relations man named Robert Mahu to uh, discredit the Nassus in the press, antagonize his partners, and disrupt his incipient monopoly. Now, this is a very rich passage. Uh, is it fair to ask what Jackie was on November 22nd? Uh, but seriously, uh, you make it sound here like the CIA conducted industrial sabotage on behalf of the Seven Sisters. Did I get that right? Is it implication? Uh, I mean, you know, I don't think the Seven Sisters said we have a problem here. Um, U.S. policymakers said, you know, they were getting complaints from uh, uh, people in the in the oil business um, that this monopoly would um, hinder U.S. interests, and um, uh, and they were working with on Onassis's uh, great rival, Stavros Niarchos, another Greek shipping magnate who also wanted to break Onassis monopoly. So um, U.S. officials got together. Niarchos provided some money. Uh, Nixon rode herd on the whole thing, and Bob Mayhew kind of executed the dirty tricks part of it. And they bombarded Onassis with lawsuits, planted newspaper stories, um, uh, uh, all sorts of complaints, and just harassed him till he eventually, the Saudis just dropped him because it was too much trouble. So, you know, it was, it was the close, the collusion of U.S. intelligence officials and, uh, you know, top people from private industry. So, yeah, it was a revealing incident. There's, there's, there's more about this in the, um, I saw a document the other day in the latest JFK releases, you know, describing Mayhew's background with the agency, um, because that was something people were wondering about when, in the 1970s, who was this guy and was he really associated with us? And indeed he was. And Mayhew did all sorts of dirty tricks. The thing that I found was about what was declassified last month was Mayhew's role in procuring women for visiting foreign dignitaries. That was one of his specialties. Um, and so that was declassified last month. Um, so yeah, just collusion is the word. Is that common, do you think? Yeah, I would assume that still goes on today. It sounds it suggests if, uh, you know, it sounds like the parallel government, you know, parallel government that uh, some people worry about, including Kennedy. So Kennedy is worried about a parallel. It's one of the in a situation where they were working in parallel, you know, uh, with the, something counter to their own interests. Well, you know, I mean, you have a CIA, which is a clandestine service by definition, and then the clandestine service itself takes operations off the record. So they're not even accountable to the minimal standards that the that the clandestine service is, you know, subject to. So that was just another layer of secrecy in which they operated. And yeah, Kennedy was definitely worried about the you know, the, the independent power of the CIA. One of the, the documents that we were most interested in for declassification uh, this time around was a memo from Arthur Schlesinger to JFK about reorganization of the CIA. That's the title of the memo. And Schlesinger goes through in a very detached but critical way about, you know, the problems that the CIA presented to Kennedy's presidency, namely that they did foreign policy by fait accompli and the State Department and the president were preempted and really ha had no policy making power compared to the CIA, at least in a lot of specific examples. And so Schlesinger lays out this case to Kennedy, who had, as we all know, mused about 
breaking the CIA up and scattering it to the winds. Well, this was the kind of formal policy execution of that impulse. It was a more restrained and technical description of how would you go about reorganizing the CIA and why. And um, there's about a page and a half of that memo that's still classified 60 years later. And the contents are controlled by the CIA. So we were very interested, is the CIA going to declassify this document? And so we went and looked and we discovered that they had declassified exactly one sentence of the page and a half that had been classified. And they said, you know, this document is available in, in, in a less redacted form. And so they basically, out of, you know, 250 words, they declassified about 18. Um, so that, that was a, a very telling example of the kind of the sham disclosure that we got last month, and also about the CIA's continuing ability to control the record and the narrative of the assassination. Yeah. Um, well, it gets back, in, in a way, it gets back to Ike's warning in you know, 1960 about the uh, military industrial complex. And you wonder, uh, you know, I've, I've seen stuff on PBS uh, through Bill Moyers, I kind of think. He, he openly admits, everybody admits it's a deep state. There's a parallel. You know, it doesn't matter what administration's in, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's things in place. Well, I mean, you know, you have the deep state, according to Trump, which is, you know, anybody who criticizes him. So the, the term itself is subject to, you know, very different interpretations. But, you know, the reality of power centers outside of the formal structures of U.S. government, yeah, that's a good that's a that that's a very sound concept. Do we call it the deep state? I mean, in light of all the Trump and Bannon bullshit, I, I tend not to. Well, I'm going with Bill Moyers' uh, version. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Since Moyers did that, the term has been debased by the proto-fascist uh, forces. They debase everything. Yeah, the master debases. Anyway, uh, Scorpion's Dance paints a mighty cozy picture of the CIA and the press and media. One reads that Richard Holmes uh, started out of college at UPI, and later he his close friendship with uh, Wayne Buckley. You know that the popular animated version of Animal Farm was a CIA production. We've learned of Operation Mockingbird. More recently, the CIA was said to have influenced the framing of Zero Dark Thirty by pushing a line out of Obama the White House, uh, you know, giving you know, Declassified on the spot information that allowed, uh, you know, like Captain Bigelow to come and say this is a journalistic movie because you provided information to the White House. Uh, what to say more about that, this kind of relationship? Because I know you're pressing on. I mean, you, you, you sort of. Well, I mean, I, th I think the story that I tell in Scorpion's Dance, I mean, you know, Dick Helms, if he hadn't gone into intelligence work, if World War II hadn't intervened, right? Say there'd been no World War II. Dick Helms would have been a newspaper publisher in the Midwest uh, of a conservative newspaper, perhaps in Indianapolis or someplace like that. So he brought a publisher's mentality and ambition to the CIA director's job, and he understood the broad importance of defining the story, capturing elite public opinion, and harnessing it towards his own ends. And that is certainly what he did as CIA director. He was not friends with William F. Buckley. He was very good friends with Howard Hunt, who was friends with William F. Buckley. And he sponsored Hunt for the purpose of burnishing the image of the CIA. And so in 1966, he gives Hunt a year off to write spy novels in the, in the vein of James Bond with the hopes that these will be picked up by Hollywood and glamorized the American clandestine service the way that the 007 movies glamorized the British intelligence service. It didn't happen because hack with Hunt was too much of a hack, uh, certainly more of a hack than Ian Fleming, and it never came to fruition. But, you know, Hunt, I mean, Helms had his eye on that kind of thing. And in a more general way, the International Operations Division of the CIA under Cord Meyer, a friend of Helms's, um, you know, worked very hard to co-opt independent sources of opinion making, like the Partisan Review or the Iowa Writers Workshop, and make sure that they that what they did didn't conflict with the CIA's goals. So that perspective of how, how do you stay on top of public opinion, appeal to public opinion, protect yourself with myth making in public opinion, 
you know, that was something that Helms and Hunt pioneered. Hunt, Hunt, Howard Hunt, you know, helped produce the animated version of Animal Farm for uh, in the 1950s. He bought the rights to, to the movie through from Sonia Orwell, George Orwell's widow, um, and arranged for a production of the film, which was a critical and commercial success. And nobody ever under, nobody ever uh, until many years later knew the hidden hand of the CIA. So, you know, does that thing still go on today? Sure, you look at movies like Argo and, and Zero Dark Thirty, you know, the CIA will extend generous cooperation to people in exchange for script approval. And when they are sure that they've got a script that suits their needs, then they provide all the help that the Hollywood could want. And that helps, you know, that makes for a better movie. You know, it's more convincing. It has more convincing details. It has more credibility in news organizations, that sort of thing. So yes, it definitely still goes on. Uh, you said this was smoking gun on the JFK assassination records around Oswald, and, you know, in the still unreleased 44 documents. Um, can you elaborate on that? The documents that I'm talking about uh, document the CIA's operational interest in Oswald and the Fair Play for Cuba Committee before Kennedy's assassination, while JFK is still alive. And this operation or operations were approved by senior agency officials. Right now, we can only see the lowest level guy who's executing their orders in Miami and New Orleans, uh, an officer named George Joannides. But what, what the documents that we're, we're seeking and that are known to exist are who authorized those operations involving the Fair Play for Cuba in 1963 that have never been disclosed. So yeah, that's the smoking gun. I expect that we will see that, that material in in the in the next year, in 2023. One, one curiosity came out from, uh, not, you know, from reading your book, it sort of, it sort of reinforced this connection between, you know, the, there was a lot of concern the, after the Kennedy assassination that Cuba's been involved and it somehow might have been involved by way of the mafia, uh, revenging, or, you know, there's, there's, all, there's all kinds of stories on the CIA. I'm surprised, you know, that for you to remind the reader that, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, four, four Cubans, Cuban Americans involved in the uh, Watergate break in Wrigley. Um, and I just, it surprised me a little bit when I thought about it. You know, why, why would we still be working with Cubans after what happened? You know, why would we take a chance of working with Cubans, given the sort of conspiracy theorizing that went along after the Kennedy assassination? The CIA never investigated Fidel Castro for possible involvement in the Kennedy assassination, which is very peculiar given that the alleged assassin was supposedly a Castro supporter affiliated with an organization, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee that supported Castro. So, you know, to me, that's kind of a giveaway, right? They knew Castro didn't kill Kennedy and they didn't investigate him because they didn't want any investigation of Oswald. Because if you investigated Oswald, the trail did not lead to Cuban intelligence. The trail led to the CIA. And so the CIA was not gonna investigate itself and so nothing happened. So, you know, that's a dog that didn't bark in the, in the in, in, to use the Sherlock Holmes story. You know, uh, it's a very strange omission and it tells you a lot and it tells you what they didn't want to do. What they didn't want to do was investigate Oswald. Well, then, speaking of that, uh, on the committee, on the, on the Warren Commission, uh, Gerald Ford was in charge of, apparently his portfolio was Oswald. You know, to make him the single. Uh, yeah, yeah. Gerald Ford and Alan Dulles were running interference for the agency from the, you know, throughout the Warren Commission proceedings. That's very clear. They wanted to make sure that uh, there was no, uh, no real investigation of the CIA's role in the events that led to the assassination, and 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 they succeeded. Okay. Uh, the church era was huge for Americans looking for closure from the 1960s and Nixon era. As, it, uh, as the committee hearing seemed to back what the Tony Felters were saying about the government. There's grief, but there's also a hickey domination. We was right about the man, and bombs were passed around in celebration of the wisdom of the demos. Then came, that came back at us on the, on the, uh, uh, on the hemp lull, the hemp muscle lull was back to sleep. And now we get this, we've got the shiver output back in the air again, and the surveillance state church warned about uh, mocking us now with the internet of everything. And as Ed Snowden tells in his memoir, we have, 
to write a record for each of us to worry about. Uh, what happened since six? Why, why, why didn't we get the message to do something about it? Well, you know, the Warren Commission is really a key moment because if there had been a real investigation of the assassination and people had known how much was known about Oswald, that the CIA's story of a quote unquote lone nut was a cover story, that this was not a guy who came out of nowhere. This was a guy who was very well known to the upper echelon. I mean, and I, when I say the upper echelon, I mean the top 20 people in the CIA uh, knew all about this guy six weeks before Kennedy was killed. If that had been known, they all would have lost their jobs and Congress would have taken a look and public, would have, public opinion would have taken a look at it. That didn't happen. The church committee 10 years later is kind of a delayed reaction to the CIA, the accumulated impact of the CIA's abuses of power, which were revealed first in the Watergate affair, six out of the seven burglars were connected with the agency. And then with the revelations of domestic spying uh, on the anti-war movement, uh, illegal opening of mail, uh, the MK Ultra mind control program, and the foreign assassination plots. And so in the 70s, with the advent of the church committee, you have a real accounting. You know, the CIA is called on the carpet for the first time. Congress stops being taking all of their statements at face value and actually looks at what they do. And the church committee issues a very comprehensive, very thorough, very fair report about what the CIA had been doing in the first 25 years of its existence. So, at, and some real reforms resulted. The creation of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, the creation of the FISA courts, um, uh, CIA's budget is cut for the first time, people are fired, unheard of in the whole history of the agency. Um, and there's a real reckoning. But with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, you know, those kind of reforms, they lose their teeth, Congress loses its appetite. Um, the Iran-Contra affair shows that the CIA's abuse of power is still a real problem. Three, three top agency officials are indicted um, uh, and um, heading for conviction when they're pardoned by President Bush. And so in both in the 1970s and, the, and, and with the Iran-Contra affair, you know, the agency is in a lot of trouble in terms of public opinion and Capitol Hill opinion, but both times they escape from their would be tormentors and you know go on to uh, achieve you know or regain the power that they had and so you know what happened well there was never there was never accountability from the start and then the entrenched power of the CIA was able to outlast its critics within the Capitol Hill system and exploit new developments 9/11 uh, to maximize its budget and its power. But, you know, the, the, one of the things that is the result of all of that is that the agency has lost a lot of credibility. Um, and you see that mostly now on the right, where um, the CIA and the FBI were once sacrosanct on the American right, both in elite and popular opinion. And now they're frankly regarded in both elite and popular opinion on the right as the enemy. As, as, as a threat to American democracy. And so the credibility that they once had with, you know, 30 or 40 percent of the population, it's gone. And um, in combination with the enduring suspicions from the liberal left, you know, I, I think they're in a more precarious situation than they've ever been. And we're going to see what's going to happen, uh, you know, with the Republicans in Congress now saying that they're going to start a a new church committee, and they invoke the church committee because precisely because it was considered a great, you know, liberal cause and accomplishment, and they want to co-op democratic criticism because liberal Democrats are not going to criticize the church committee. They're going to say that was a good thing, and you know, I think the idea of another church committee is a good idea. Uh, I don't think that that's what these people have in mind. That's the problem. Hey, uh, John, your audio kicked out. I'm not hearing you. 
Is that me or you? My audio is fine, but all of a sudden I stopped hearing you. Can you check your volume or your mute? Is that better? Yes, now I can yes. hear you. Okay. okay. Well, I was saying, you know, the FBI, the more recent, like, uh, I think Mark Feld, the untold story of Mark Feld, was not a whistleblower. You know, he was an associate director of the FBI who didn't get promoted. Yeah, but you know what? I don't think Mark Feld was very important in the Watergate story. You know, the movie version exaggerates the role of Mark Felt that is described in the book version. Yeah. And he did not drive Woodward and Bernstein's coverage. They drove it, and he confirmed some aspects of it. I don't think uh, Mark Water Mark Felt is very important in the in the Watergate revelations. I don't. Okay. And then uh, I was saying, uh, but he was pushed that way. I mean, he was made to be the you know this this guy named Deep Throat, the you know, secret stuff. But the other thing is, um, the whistleblower for Trump, you know, the one that uh, got the third hand information about the telephone call to uh, Zelensky. Um, Wait, uh, the information was, about, was not third hand. It was confirmed. But yes, yeah, he was a CIA guy. Right. And then John Kerryco came on and said, there's no way this guy's a legitimate whistleblower because um, from my know, he would never be trusted within the agency because he's a king killer. Uh, if, he, if he's willing to take out the president, then why would he uh, uh, cover for any of us? You know, that, that was his reasoning. Uh, now, I have my own doubts about Kerryco, but uh, uh, but that's so I'm just saying, I mean, he's still working for the CIA as far as I know. And that, that's kind of a surprise to Kerryco. Um, well. Uh, I think that, you know, the story of the first impeachment is the story that I was talking about before, which is the national security establishment really rallies around this case as, mm -hmm. you know, an abuse of power that threatens the way the U.S. operates in the world. And it's this it's a CIA claim. It comes from a CIA guy. It's backed by the entire intelligence establishment. It's yeah. the backing of the entire intelligence establishment that convinces Nancy Pelosi to drop her resistance to impeachment and go ahead and do it. And mm -hmm. when they take their case to public opinion, it's a big dud because 50 percent of the American people just say, we don't believe you and we don't care. That's the CIA's problem is they don't have they, they have lost a lot of credibility in the real world of Washington politics. And the, the Ukraine impeachment effort, which I think was a real abuse of power, was an impeachable offense, um, factually established, um, you know, it had no traction because these agencies have no credibility with a lot of people.